Um, good morning, everyone across the nation. This is Kalima Rose at PolicyLink, and we welcome you to today's webinar, Advancement for Equity, the Game-Changing Rule Coming from HUD. And we have several esteemed staff and guests with us today that are going to lay out for you in the field uh, the new Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Rule that we expect to be released from HUD very soon. Our founder and CEO, Angela Glover Blackwell, will kick us off. And she will be followed by my um, colleague, Sarita Turner, here at PolicyLink in the Center for Infrastructure Equity. Then Richard Mark Antonio, Managing Attorney at Public Advocates in San Francisco, is going to walk us through how um, the principles of the rule have been at play here in the Bay Area. And then Jennifer Munt, who serves on the Metropolitan Council um, in the Twin Cities, where they have been enacting a fair housing assessment there, will tell us how it has been used to advance equity. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Angela. And I encourage you all participants throughout the session to type um, any questions that you have into your little dashboard, and we will take them up as we go. So here's Angela. Hello, it's Angela Glover Blackwell, founder and CEO of PolicyLink, and welcome. This is such an important area for discussion, and I am pleased that you have joined to hear more about affirmatively furthering fair housing. As you know, PolicyLink is a research and action institute dedicated to fostering equitable communities of opportunity by lifting up what works. When we talk about equity, what we mean is just and fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. The goals of equity require that we create the conditions that create pathways from hope to change, that we work together to make sure that we are innovating, that we are throwing out the old rules, that we are bringing everything into the conversation and understanding that to achieve a fully inclusive society, we're going to have to do business differently. And when we think about that, housing is front and center. Sadly, we live in a nation in which where you live is the proxy for opportunity. It determines access to education, access to transportation, access to healthy food through grocery stores and farmers markets. It even determines how long you live. Where you live can be directly tied to your life expectancy. So when we think about housing, yes, it's important that the housing is affordable. Yes, it is important that the housing is safe. But housing is the linchpin in the opportunity ladder. And so we are so excited that HUD has joined with so many of us who have understood the way that we have to think about housing in context to begin to align the affirmatively furthering fair housing requirements with the reality of how to create greater opportunity. PolicyLink has really had the honor of helping HUD to develop this strategy. Back in 2009, 2010, I served as part of a three-person brain trust with the Department of Housing and Urban Development to help craft the new Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Rule. We consulted directly with Secretary Sean Donovan and Deputy Secretary Ron Sims and other assistant secretaries in trying to look at the data, think about the reality, and align the rule with what we need as a nation. It has really been quite a journey, and it has been exciting to see that in the testing of this rule, how it does begin to get at the issues that are so crucial. Some of you might ask, why after all these years, the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968, why after all these years, we still need a Fair Housing Act? Not only is racial discrimination still way too pre prevalent in this nation, but we also know that because of redlining, because of other restrictions that were actually enforced by the federal government years ago, many low-income people of color live in communities that have been the only places that have been accessible to them that isolate them from opportunity. We need to really have a way to think about that reality, understand what it takes to create true pathways to opportunity, and align our practice, particularly the practice at HUD, with the best knowledge that we have. We are so proud of Secretary Castro and the, leader that he has, the leadership that he has brought to this, the way he has continued the efforts that began before his tenure, and the commitment that he's making to build a society in which all can participate and prosper. To talk more about the rule, to give you specifics about it, I want to turn to my colleague, Sarita Turner. 
Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. So a couple of things that are really important to note about the rule. It really does three key things. First, it clarifies the definition of affirmatively furthering fair housing to include actions that not only expand access to opportunity for low-income people and protected classes, but it spurs investment in high-poverty communities. Next, it improves on the current process that local jurisdictions undertake to ensure that HUD funds are being used to further fair housing by aligning fair housing goals with the use of federal resources. HUD developed and is implementing the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Rule in response to concerns raised by the Government Accountability Office and various stakeholders. The rule has been tested. Over the past three years, HUD piloted the rule in 74 regions, and this was through direct work on the ground with um, the jurisdictions that will have to now comply with the rule. Also, the rule empowers local jur jurisdictions with an assessment tool that provides consistent data to ensure that grantees can measure their progress on reducing income segregation and racially concentrated areas of poverty. The, rule, the assessment tool includes measures of exposure to environmental hazards, school performance data, and transportation access to job centers. Fair housing strategies can focus on both expanding access to quality housing and good jobs, transportation, and healthy environment. Lastly, the rule will call for an assessment of fair housing and goal setting every five years and then require that resources are aligned towards solving the challenges identified in the assessment. So some may ask, and Angela touched on this a bit, why do we need the rule? Well, it goes back to the historical roots of housing segregation in our nation. Redlining denied mortgage lending for housing in neighborhoods where people of color lived and discouraged any investment in these neighborhoods. Urban renew renewal efforts demolished central city housing and low-income um, housing units and displaced people of color and intensified residential segregation. Exclusionary covenants in deeds and contracts prohibited sales and occupation of property to low to people of color, and these communities were bled dry of public and private investments. Businesses of color were denied capital and operating loans, and the libraries, schools, parks, etc., suffered from uneven investments. So this redlining map from 1933 shows in Cleveland, this is just a little example here, or a big example, of how prior redlining practices are now playing themselves out today and why the rule is necessary. This um, 1939 map shows a Cleveland neighborhood that was deemed high risk and to be avoided because of undesirable inhabitant types. These neighborhoods were overwhelmingly African American and were excluded from the mortgage market, creating a cycle of insecurity and poverty. And as we look at this map, um, we see that the map really, the pink areas show us that it is the same red line neighborhood from the previous map that we looked at, and that in 2009, um, the predatory lending, when the housing market crashed, this is where most of the, it was discovered, this is where many of the predatory loans and the highest foreclosure rates occurred in that city. So African Americans still represent a disproportionate amount of the residents living in these formerly red line neighborhoods, many of which continue to suffer from disinvestment, decline, and inequality. The rule is also critically important to the economy. Income inequality hurts economic growth. We, there's a growing consensus from the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Guardian, the um, Economist, where we are hearing news stories um, pretty consistently now that tell us that income inequality is bad for an economy that we all need to participate and prosper in. So the rule is important for the economy also because if we get equity right, we'll get the economy right. 
And here's why. Today, more than 50% of babies born in the United States are of color. 39% of Americans are people of color. 48% of children under 18 are children of color. People of color accounted for 98% of population growth in large metro areas from 2000 to 2010. So as we can see from this data, that it is really critically important that we pay attention to the needs of people of color and um, our growing um, representation of children of color in this region. And in fact, the projected population growth from 2010 to 2040 in the nation um, is represented on this map. And as you can see, it is tremendous. Um, people of color are driving growth tremendously. Next slide, please. So the rule is critically important. Again, looking at the prior map, our drastic demographic shift in the country and really looking at this slide that shows us the percentages of 16 to 24 year olds in our country that are not working or in school. So as we can see, the people that are driving growth in this country are a growing share of the folks, our youth, who are disconnected from work and disconnected from school. The rule is important for the economy, again, because the folks that are driving growth in our nation are represented more um, in, in extremely high numbers, as we can see from this chart, in high poverty neighborhoods. And finally, the final point that we want to make about the, econ the economic impacts of the rule and the opportunities that the rule um, poses for us is that in the United States in 2012, the economy would have been, our GDP would have been $200 billion higher if there had been no racial gaps in the economy. It is critical that we pay attention to the needs of our growing populations of color. We are leaving money on the table. And so again, people cannot thrive and have hope and develop a dream for a bright future growing up in neighborhoods that are bled dry of disinvestment. No child, very few children growing up in a neighborhood that looks like this one could think about what they can aspire to be and how they would become uh, great, have a great career, and um, become an active participant in our economy. The rule was piloted as we mentioned before, in 87 regions. Um, so it's been tried and tested. And um, these are a couple of examples. So this example is from St. Louis, where we see um, St. Louis was afford, uh, awarded a sustainable communities planning grant. The grant, um, these regional planning grant awardees conducted fair housing and equity assessments that were used to pilot the rules. So in the findings in the St. Louis example that we're looking at, the assessment showed that segregation remains a persistent issue. The location of affordable housing perpetuates segregation in racially concentrated areas of poverty. And it, we need increased quality of life investments in these communities. Next slide, please. There's another example here from Baltimore. Baltimore utilized a similar Sustainable Communities Initiative grant to conduct assessment of their fair housing issues. And the trends then explicitly um, pointed them to develop a multi-jurisdictional regional housing plan to address the disparities that they found. And Baltimore, the Baltimore Metropolitan Council actually created a housing, a housing policy coordinator position to advance the recommendations and ensure that Baltimore stays on track to address the findings of their assessment. So I am going to now turn it over to our next speaker. Richard Marcantonio from Public Advocates, and he is going to walk you through um, some additional highlights and opportunities that the rule poses. Thank you, Sarita. Good morning, everybody. Or good afternoon. Well, it's good morning, I guess, for everybody. 
Um, I'm Richard Mark Antonio with Public Advocates in San Francisco, and we're a nonprofit law and policy advocacy organization that challenges the systemic causes of poverty and racial discrimination. And I head up our metropolitan equity and climate justice practice areas. Affirmatively furthering fair housing, I'm just going to say AFFH for short, uh, is a tool that can powerfully support community organizing and local equity campaigns in underserved communities. So that's the focus uh, of my remarks this morning. And I'm going to talk about two things. First, a, a case study uh, from a campaign in Marin County, California, that leveraged AFFH requirements and some of the lessons we learned there. And then briefly, uh, I'm going to introduce a framework we've been developing that community groups can use to assess the equity of proposed projects and investments and develop alternative equity uh, proposals. So let me start with the Marin County. This is beautiful Marin County. As you can see, it's just uh, over the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. And uh, it is a very white and affluent county in a majority minority region. Uh, it's an example of what we would call an exclusionary high opportunity suburb. Uh, and to contextualize this, many of you have probably read about the exciting new study. This was a couple of weeks ago on the front page of the Times where I read it, uh, that found significant educational and economic benefits to young children who moved from underserved communities to uh, high opportunity areas. Well, Marin is one of those areas. And um, uh, the, uh, if you go back just a second, thanks. This, this, uh, ex this first bullet on the expected racial composition, um, I won't get into how that is, is uh, uh, calculated, but basically it shows that if the, um, uh, if the income levels in Marin represented uh, demographically the income levels in the region as a whole, you'd expect the region, uh, the, the county rather, to be 82% 80, white instead of 57. Or rather, it is 82%. It would be 57% white. So this is a, a pretty striking metric. It shows that segregation in Marin County is not just about uh, affordability of housing, all that, although that's also important. Uh, but it has other uh, other roots as well. So um, I'm going to just go very quickly here because uh, a lot of this has already been covered. But um, you know the uh, the affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, regime that we have in place right now, while we're waiting for the final rule to come out of HUD, uh, basically it's it's both about overcoming segregation and about access to opportunity, uh, but it, ha it hasn't been very strong, and we're waiting for this much stronger rule uh, to come about. Well, so here's uh, what happened in Marin. The, um, the requirements um, hadn't been very effectively enforced until racial justice advocates in New York sued Westchester County for falsely certifying to HUD that it was affirmatively furthering fair housing. Uh, and that was uh, in 2009 that they won a key court ruling. And that's really when things started to change. Soon afterward, HUD conducted a compliance review that found Marin County was not in compliance with AFFH requirements. And it was about this time, by the way, that, the, um, that HUD started talking about adopting a formal AFFH regulation to supersede the existing handbook. Uh, in the compliance review of Marin, HUD found that it hadn't updated its uh, what was what, what was called its analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. That's now going to be called an assessment of fair housing, but that's basically what it's about. Uh, that there were exclusionary zoning policies in Marin that had a disparate racial impact on uh, Latinos and African Americans. Uh, that Marin residents were uh, of color were highly segregated basically into two census tracts. And basically that uh, in the past 15 years, Marin had not uh, taken action to overcome the, the effects of the impediments it had identified in, in the mid-90s. So this led to a voluntary compliance agreement between the county and, and HUD. 
And it was at that point that the Marin Action Coalition for Equity came together. And, you know, really, uh, these were racial justice advocates who had been fighting for a long time in Marin uh, to have the needs of their communities, uh, you know, taken seriously, have the voices heard, and have those needs met. And they really saw this as an opportunity to move a whole range of issues that they had been working on, the exclusion of minority uh, families from many communities, the concentration of people of color in those two uh, census tracts, and the fact that resources were not being allocated fairly there, uh, the exclusion of people of color from decision-making bodies, inadequate public transit service, jobs, a whole range of things. And uh, so ACE invited public advocates to the table and we helped educate the coalition about the AFFH requirements and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act uh, and helped them analyze the draft analysis of impediments and, and identify their priorities for action. So one of the things that ACE did is they developed a joint platform of ASKS uh, they developed a communication strategy that put a human face on the issues, and they held many public and private meetings, both with county officials and with HUD. And one of the initial asks related to the fact that the county went ahead and drafted their new analysis of impediments with virtually no input from uh, communities of color. So that was already a, a, a big concern. Uh, but they also focused um, uh, and this was really the, the bulk of the campaign was focused on the absence of strong actions. The, the analysis of impediments that came out did in fact identify a lot of uh, issues about segregation and in inequality in the county, but there really were no strong actions. And so, um, so that was the, the focus of the campaign and it had mixed success. You know, ACE won a stronger analysis of impediments uh, and it also won some strong county commitments to take action, for instance, rezoning and other steps to promote affordable housing, more funding for bus service, uh, representation of uh, people of color and people with disabilities in the process of allocating block grant funds, and uh, actually a commitment to integrate AFFH and Title VI policies and oversights into all county programs. We also got a process for regular consultation to track implementation of the action plan. And I'll just share a kind of a high point and a low point. My, the high point was when the, plan, the action plan was adopted by the County Board of Supervisors in 2011. And at that hearing, one of the supervisors said this about the concerns of the 11 cities and towns within the county. She said, we know they're concerned about local control. We know they're concerned about unfunded mandates, but this is fulfilling Title VI, which says that's discrimination and that that's what supersedes everything else in planning. Well, that was the high point. The low point is that there were actually no actions for the cities or towns in the action plan. They didn't have to do anything under that plan, and uh, the coalition did not succeed in persuading HUD to require that. So just quickly, some of the lessons that I took away from this. HUD's upfront action was, was very helpful in creating an opening, uh, but they ultimately didn't follow through with enforcement. Uh, second, it's important to tie the affirmatively further and fair housing strategy to local policy and organizing campaigns that have active community engagement. And I'll talk about some of those uh, kinds of campaigns. Uh, that AFFH can support. And then it's important to develop your own platform of action priorities. Uh, those commitments are really the key focal point in my view. And, uh, you know, some communities have taken this a step further. They've done exciting work making a ca campaign out of creating a people's analysis of impediments. Uh, so really taking, uh, seizing that power to create your own alternative, I think, is a really crucial strategy here. Um, and then finally, implementation and watchdogging is needed at all levels, at the, 
at the county level and down at the city level and then up to the state and federal levels as well. The state government is also subject to these requirements. So to summarize uh, the range of types of campaigns that this rule can help you with, uh, it can, well anyway, here it is, it's on the slide, I won't read it, but the first step may be educating the community groups you work with about the breadth of the tool and then the community can identify its top priorities and either build a campaign around them or use the AFFH requirements as a tool in your existing campaigns. So, you know, equitable investment of public funds. I'll say more about that, but um, right now I just want to emphasize this is not just about HUD funds. This is a, I, I hear this a lot that people think that, oh, it's only the HUD money. And, you know, the HUD money is not a lot of money in most communities. But one dollar of federal funding and you're subject to Title VI for all of your programs and, and, uh, uh, and ensuring non-discrimination. So, uh, don't, you know, t let's take the blinders off in that respect. Uh, it's about affordable housing, but it's not, as Angela said, it's not just about affordable housing. It's about community benefits. There's a, in the proposed rule, there's a whole section about uh, analyzing and opening up access to community assets. Uh, we're also looking at it as an anti-displacement tool. And, uh, and so why don't we just move to the next slide. Um, so you can see that the Marine campaign was just one example of an array of possible local organizing and policy campaigns. We've been developing a framework that I hope will be helpful in planning and carrying out a whole range of local equity campaigns. So I'd like to close with a, just a brief introduction to that framework. So first a little background about why we thought this would be important. Have you ever heard either of these responses? First, there's what I like to call the equity agnostics. They want a definition. And then there are the decision makers who think that equity is part of everything they do, and maybe we'd call them the equity pantheists. One example of this mindset that we see a lot is the assumption that any development or investment that's made within a lower income community of color is a benefit to that community. And we know that's not true. Think about urban renewal. You know, you saw some slides in Angela's present in uh, Sarita's presentation. Uh, who benefited and who was devastated? You know, that's, those were investments made in communities of color. They were not benefits. Today, that remains the case. Major investments continue to be made in underserved communities that don't meet residents' needs and may actually harm them. And for us, the poster child is this half billion dollar commuter rail extension from East Oakland to the Oakland airport. It doesn't get low income residents of color where they need to go. And the one way fare for the five or 10 minute trip is $6. So the details really do matter when we're you know, assessing the equity and, and the benefits of investments and, and development. At the same time, it's important that we don't let the details overwhelm what really matters. You know, frequently I, campaigns have a laundry list of asks, and that doesn't tell a compelling story. It also doesn't galvanize a broad set of stakeholders who can join you to, to win. So we set out to develop this framework in order to answer the, both the agnostics and the pantheists, to keep it simple, and to demonstrate whether a particular policy or a community alternative would meaningfully benefit an underserved community. So here's the basic framework, and it's structured around these four questions. For instance, question one asks whether the policy or investment meets an important community need. And for the uh, Oakland Airport Connector project, the answer was no, since few residents of that low-income community needed to get to the airport and the cost was prohibitive. So I won't go through these one by one, but if, you know, this is the framework where if you can't answer yes to each of these questions, then I think you know this is helpful in pinpointing a problem. And uh, so just to wrap this up, I, I think some ways that we found this is useful is to use it as a template for analyzing and demonstrating the inequities 
in a proposal that you're facing, um, to use it to create your own alternative, to use it to compare the equity impacts of multiple alternatives, and, and even in communications to be able to use it to create talking points that tie the community need to what you're asking for. So I'm going to wrap it up now. I hope this is helpful as you work to harness the power of the new any day now AFFH rule to tackling the challenges of segregation, diversion of resources, and exclusion from opportunity in your community and region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Very illuminating. I would now like to turn it over to Jennifer Munt, who is a Metropolitan Council member um, from District 3 in the Twin Cities. And she was appointed to the Metropolitan Council in 2011 by Governor Mark Dayton. And um, her district includes Hennepin County, um, cities of Clown Haas and Deep Haven, Eden Prairie, et cetera. There's many. And um, the particular expertise that Jennifer brings to the board is that she's the public affairs director for Ask Me Council 5. Um, and we are very excited to hear her perspective coming from a labor background and serving the Metropolitan Council in the Twin Cities is one that has very extensive powers beyond transportation planning. Um, they oversee land use and housing money as well. So Jennifer, over to you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, whether I'm speaking as a policymaker or as a union organizer, there is one shared belief, and that is if people are good enough to work in a community, then surely they're good enough to live in the community. But that isn't always the case in the Twin Cities region, and um, we believe that government has a responsibility to make sure that people have affordable choices to live where they work. I'd like to share with folks um, some of the equitable development that we are moving forward in uh, the seven county metropolitan area that includes Minneapolis and St. Paul. First of all, a little bit about the Met Council. Um, we are about buses and flushes and parks and affordable housing. Our annual operating budget is about a billion dollars and our capital budget is over 500 million. How those investments are made um, can be made in ways that help us overcome segregation and increase opportunity and, and create broad prosperity for everybody in our region. Um, what I'd like to share with folks is some of the things that we have done to advance equitable development as we wait for HUD to decide on its rules. So one of the other things we do in addition to providing services is we are the regional planning agency for the metro area. So we coordinate growth and development with local governments and we work with uh, the cities on their local comprehensive plans and on their development projects. We are also the largest um, voucher distributor within the metropolitan area. So for us, our fair housing equity assessment was called choice, place, and opportunity. And for us, that uh, fair housing and equity assessment analyzed uh, four things. First, it looked at communities with concentrations of both race and poverty. It identified geographies of opportunity, and it identified connections to opportunity in public investments. And it had an impact on the regional planning that everyone um, in our region is doing. Uh, comprehensive plans will be advancing uh, again uh, for the next 10 years. So all of our FHEA work is informing how the region plans for future growth. One of the things that we know in our region is that 43% of our population will be people of color by the year 2040, and we want to seize the opportunities that that brings to our region and to our future workforce. So 
our choice, place, and opportunity, um, first it started with data. And the data was about understanding the historical, the current, and the future context for equity and opportunity. Um, we realized that certain areas have been left behind by decades of disinvestment. And we had long conversations with our regional leaders about how poverty is place-based, not person-based. Um, it was a very controversial uh, topic. Uh, we are one of the first government organizations to directly engage in conversations about race and poverty and how we can close what have become some of the worst um, gaps in the nation. Uh, if you look at income, education, and home ownership, the Twin Cities metropolitan area has uh, some of the biggest gaps in the nation, and that's something that we need to be ashamed of and it's something that we need to address. So we engaged regional leaders and stakeholders in taking a look at, at what the data showed us. And then we increased, we integrated the knowledge that we developed into the development of Thrive uh, 2040, which for us is our blueprint for how the region will grow uh, during the next uh, 30 years. So we looked at how we can focus on improving access to opportunity, how we can balance mobility, access, and choice. So Thrive 2040 was focused on five outcomes. The outcomes were stewardship, broad prosperity, equity, livability, and sustainability. And there were three guiding principles to the work that we do. First, it was about integration. And by that, I mean breaking out of our silos. Um, as HUD is trying to do along transit corridors, we are trying to integrate the work that we do for buses, flushes, parks, and affordable housing. And we're making those decisions not as separate um, Paths, but rather integrating all of those things into creating opportunity-rich communities. It was about collaboration with local government partners, community organizations, and the residents who receive the services that we provide. And it was about accountability. And by that, I mean both qualitative and quantitative measurements of our success. So for us, um, I've been on the Met Council for five years. It took 17 of us a full four years to have a shared definition of equity. And this is what we came up with. Equity connects all residents to opportunity and creates viable housing, transportation, and recreation opportunities for people of all races, ethnicities, incomes, and abilities so that all communities share the opportunity and the challenge of growth and change. For our region to reach its full economic potential, all of our residents must be able to access opportunity. Our region is stronger when all people live in communities that provide them access to opportunities for success, prosperity, and quality of life. That definition, um, was shaped around discussions where, for some, equity meant that everybody gets a piece. That if you are a net contributor to the region in terms of taxes, that you would be a net recipient. For others, equity meant that we would look back on decades of disinvestment and make right by those communities where disinvestment had been chronic. Um, what we learned is that we had to break out of the zero-sum framework, and we refused to pit one group of people against another group. We decided that our goal was to create an entire region that's rich with opportunities, and that we needed to focus where the Met Council could do that and where we could engage partners in doing that in their realm. So 
So one of the big challenges for us was to define fair and affordable housing. Once we were able to separate the two and recognize that there are different tactics for each policy goal. So being able to educate the public that fair housing is really about freedom from discrimination and affordable housing is about making sure that there are housing opportunities that allow households to pay a reasonable share of their income on costs, on their housing costs. When we talked about people shouldn't have to spend more than 30% of their income on housing, that was something that anybody in the region could understand. And for us, um, being able to define that for policymakers and for the public was key to getting over a barrier of uh, what tactics we were really talking about. So when you look at fair housing, we're talking about mortgage lending discrimination, real estate steering, uh, barriers in rental housing, and by that we mean landlord discrimination. And it was also about where affordable opportunities are. When, when we talk to folks um, in the Somali community, for example, we have about 6,000 Somali residents in one of the most affluent suburbs of the Twin Cities uh, called Eden Prairie. They told us that our housing policies were preventing them from joining the middle class. The reason is that many immigrant families value the extended family. Economic opportunity means being able to have the grandparents take care of the grandkids while the parents go to work. But our housing policies prohibited that because we didn't have places where you could get a three or four bedroom apartment in the suburbs. Then we also talked about affordable housing, which is about providing the assistance to households, the vouchers that Met Council dispenses down payment assistance, that sort of thing. We just opened up our housing vouchers. We had 2,000 housing vouchers, and there were 36,000 people who applied for them. So it became very clear that we need more resources in order to help people afford their housing. And we knew that it was about income restrictions and, and subsidized opportunities and we also saw that there were places where there was naturally occurring um, how affordable housing for low and moderate income families. In the western suburbs where I represent folks, the suburb of St. Louis Park has more affordable housing than all other suburbs in the western metro area combined. And most of that housing is, um, is naturally occurring. We also looked at uh, what equitable development means and how we can encourage it. And what that means for us is that everybody has access to living wage jobs, to entrepreneurial opportunities, to viable housing choices, to public transportation, to good schools, to strong social networks, to safe and walkable streets, to public services that people need and deserve, to parks, and access to healthy food. One of the things um, that we were able to do was to launch a new mobility counseling program. Our mobility counseling program assists voucher holders in moving out of concentrated areas of poverty and into areas of opportunity. So we attack this at four different levels. It starts with recruiting landlords to participate in the voucher program. It's about recruiting participants so that they can choose to live in areas that are rich with opportunity. It's about pre-move counseling so that we can help people make choices. If they have kids, let's take a look at where the good schools are. If they don't have a car, let's look at where uh, affordable housing connects to living wage jobs along a transit corridor. It was about housing search assistance, 
and the post-move counseling to follow up on whether or not we were meeting the needs of families that were looking to relocate in opportunity-rich areas. So now that we have 2,000 people that hold fresh vouchers, we're trying to help them locate in places where they choose uh, their future in a way that helps their family share in the prosperity of our region. Now, my district includes um, a future light rail corridor. So I'd like to talk with you about how we bring opportunity to this area. So the Southwest light rail line is the third light rail line in the Twin Cities area. It includes the city of Minneapolis on the north end and the suburb of Eden Prairie at the south end. And I'd like to zero in on the Blake Road Station, which is a suburban station on the Hopkins-St. Louis Park border. There's the station in the, in the red circle. So we focused our planning and our resources under the umbrella of community works. That's where all of the government partners that you see listed on this slide come together to find the sweet spot. And the sweet spot for us is where we connect affordable housing to living wage jobs. So the Blake Road Station, if you take a look at the station, within a half mile of the station, it's located in an urban corridor of diverse residents with natural amenities and development opportunities. The station is located within a corridor that has 90% rental housing with large immigrant population clusters. I'm told that there are 78 different languages spoken in the public housing in that area. But the surrounding area, if you take a look at it, it includes parks, the Blake School, 43 Hoops Basketball Academy, and two Fortune 500 companies that include Cargill and um, Super Value. The area has a population of 5,395 residents, 2,443 households, and over 2,000 jobs. This is what that area looks like today. Um, people in wheelchairs risk becoming hood ornaments, just trying to get between where they live and where they shop and where they work. We've come together with other government agencies to look at how we create a complete street where people can bike and walk and, and without having a car. What we know in the Twin Cities area, if a family can get by on one car instead of two, they have $10,000 more in their pocket. That can produce opportunities to own a home instead of renting a home. It can produce measurable outcomes for your kids if you can invest that money in Wi-Fi and computers at home and in opportunities for your kids um, to participate in extracurricular activities. So giving people the opportunity to live without two cars, to live without a car even, um, is huge in terms of being able to afford housing. We also created Corridors of Opportunity in partnership with HUD. And what Corridors of Opportunity means is that we directly engage communities in shaping the neighborhoods that they want to live in in the future. The way that the communities put it is nothing about us without us. And I have a firm belief that residents will hold their leaders accountable for the promises and for the outcomes that we agree upon. As an appointed official, I will, I will come and go, but the residents will remain in their community, and it is so important that they are stakeholders in the vision of what their community can be. So some of our goals 
for the Blake Road Station uh, developed by the community. It was to increase the intensity of a mix of land uses, create a walkable and bikeable neighborhood. They wanted to improve green spaces and green connections. They wanted to increase the mix of housing choices, preserve affordable housing, focus on neighborhood-oriented retail, and they wanted to grow their tax base. This is a picture of green space in the Cottageville Park. Partners were able to create a plan for a park that will reconnect people to Minnehaha Creek. It includes a lawn, it, it includes a community pavilion, and a soccer field, the kind of park that the neighborhoods in that area said that they wanted. Here you see uh, what we call the cold storage site. It is one of the largest undeveloped sites in the entire Twin Cities metropolitan area. There's 17 acres and there are already developers expressing an interest in building mixed income housing because this will be the site of a future light rail station. So folks, that is um, the end of my presentation. But my point is that there are a lot of things that you can do to overcome segregation and to increase opportunity while we wait for HUD to make decisions about the housing rules. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was a very enlightening presentation. And um, I'm going to sound a little bit e echoey right now because I've put us on speakerphone so that we can answer questions. Um, Jennifer, I was wondering if you could say one thing about the policy that the Metropolitan Council passed tying transportation investments to affordable housing. It seems like that was one very important. There's several questions coming in about if there's no additional HUD resources and this rule is focused on opportunity, is that going to reduce the resources going to high poverty communities? And so I would say writ large, the answer is it should drive all kinds of investments beyond housing to um, those neighborhoods while doing things like the mobility of vouchers to higher opportunity, right? So it's learning how to balance those. But I think the Met Council um, grappled with that. And so if you could say a word about that, Jennifer, I think it would be helpful. Absolutely. One of the pieces um, that's included in Thrive, our development framework, is our first housing plan in the last 30 years. Our last housing plan was 1985, and one of the concerns in wiping that off the books with the new plan was that we needed to retain the civil rights underpinnings of the 1985 uh, housing plan. One of the things that we did was a fair housing equity assessment, and in doing that, we created housing scores for each community those scores factor into the criteria when we give grants and when we um, disperse money for transportation projects, both transit and roads. So what we're doing is we're tying um, housing outcomes to our investments that we make moving forward. And for us, it isn't just about giving people opportunities to thrive in the suburbs. It's also about looking at communities where there have been decades of disinvestment and looking at how we bring opportunity there. One of the things that we're very excited about right now is the Botano Corridor through uh, North Minneapolis. That's an area where there has been decades of disinvestment. And we, I personally am excited at looking at the concept of business clusters where you allow businesses to um, develop along transit corridors in a way that allows you to train the workforce of the future for the jobs that are coming to a rail corridor. If it takes us four years 
to build a light rail line through North Minneapolis. We've got four years to train the workers in that community so that they can have the jobs of the future that will allow them to earn a living wage, to have health care so that they can prevent their families from getting sick, so that the people in those neighborhoods who stuck it out through tough times can benefit from the prosperity that our rail investment brings. Um, I think Richard had a quick example also from the Bay Area. Yeah, we, we do. The, you know, the transportation funds federally uh, are far greater, as you know, than, than the funds that HUD gives out and um, the, the block grant funds. And what we did with working with an equity coalition in the nine county region here in connection with the uh, Metropolitan Trans Transportation Commission's you know, federally required long range transportation plan is we said, look, you should set aside a pot of money that you normally give to the local jurisdictions to fill potholes and put some requirements on that in terms of affordable housing. And they, they, they got part way and it actually was fairly successful in a limited way. They said, you need to have a state certified affordable housing plan in order to qualify for this money. And lo and behold, even though it was not a great deal of money uh, in any given jurisdiction, a lot of the suburban communities that had been dragging their feet on complying with that law came into compliance and rezoned sites for affordable housing. Um, so we are out of time, and I'm sorry because I know we could go on for another hour. Um, but I think our main purpose today in asking all of you to join us is to both understand what the rule um, is going to do and to ask you to be engaged when your community um, faces its first assessment of fair housing so that you can um, be a leader in helping define the opportunity structures and the allocation of resources in your city, county, region, or state. And we expect with the release of the rule that HUD will be releasing the um, initial jurisdictions that will be going first in line. And so we will be reaching out to you again when we get that list to make sure that all the first jurisdictions give a very strong showing and can um, lay a new foundation for making equity and opportunity investments in our communities. Um, we can use Jennifer to switch back to the equity summit slide. At the end of uh, um, October, Policy Link will be hosting an equity summit where we will be dedicating um, a day pre-conference to this topic to really build the capacity of partners and show the promising equity outcomes that have come from the pilot like Jennifer's. And we hope that all of you will join. There are current discounts for those of you that join early. And so if you go right now to www.equity2015.org and register, um, we can join with you in making a powerful showing of the new rule. So thank you all for joining. Uh, the crowds outside at PolicyLink are cheering because they know you're going to be our champions. Feel free to email either Sarita or I, and we will be emailing this presentation out to all of you who joined us today. So thank you, and thanks to our team guests.